My name is uh, Greg Simons, and the title for the, for the book, it, it was the uh, complexities of Ukrainian crisis management. Um, and that this book came out to 2017, so it's a, a little time ago, but it was actually the very first book that came out specifically uh, on Ukrainian crisis management and their approach to it. If one wants to be concise, what is a crisis? Well, the, the first point, it's an extraordinary circumstance. So it's something which is uh, beyond the realm of the normal, and it's usually quite disruptive. And if we go to a more uh, rigid academic definition, what defines a crisis from another period, which is you might have you have different levels of disruption. A crisis is the one which inflicts the most disruption to the functioning of society. And in general, it has to have three simultaneously occurring uh, elements. One of these is a threat to values. And this, and a value can be different things. So it, it can be the loss of human life, the threat to property, but it can also be uh, the threat to an economy, the threat to uh, national infrastructure. It could be a, a threat to the, um, the, the functioning of uh, religion or all kinds of different things. But it, it has to be some kind of generally accepted threat to society in the form of a value or a norm. Uh, the second point is that it's the level of unpredictability and uncertainty. So when you have a crisis, it's not really known uh, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So this exacerbates the, the problem of a crisis in terms of how it's perceived, how it's reacted to the understanding of risk and hazard, these kinds of points. And the, the third and final one is the issue of time constraint. And this is the basic point. The longer a crisis event continues, the more damage is done to the normal functioning of society. So the longer it takes to recover, not to the original point, but to a greater level of uh, functionality, which was lost because of the crisis event. And of course, when we talk about crises, these can be man-made, they can be natural, uh, so it can be from terrorism, cyber attack, uh, armed conflict, uh, a, a, a economic crash such as the Great Depression, uh, but it can also be a flood uh, it can be uh, some kind of natural disaster like the tsunami of 2004. So it's a wide range of different things. And generally speaking, they're classified as a sudden crisis, such as something which, uh, an act of terrorism, for example, something which was not building up. And then you have a creeping crisis. And a creeping crisis, uh, it's kind of predictable because, for example, the lack of maintenance of critical infrastructure, for example. Uh, so, for example, you have a lot of these power blackouts because the electric grid failed. And it's known that the lack of maintenance is going to lead to a problem in the future, but no one does anything about it until the, the crisis occurs, that is the breakdown of the electric grid. This has happened in numerous places, including uh, New Zealand, Sweden, different places, but it's generally not seen. It's ignored. And that's what you have a creeper crisis that builds up. So the book uh, itself covered both sorts of crises, one which is a sudden outbreak and the, the, the other one, the creeping crisis. Well, I mean, it's been very varied. Uh, of course, it's problematic for a country like Ukraine, Ukraine's not alone in this regard, because it, it's it's shift. It was uh, during the the time of the book and a number of the crises which were investigated in the book. It was transitioning from one particular political and economic and social system to another one, 
And so it, it has some uh, management strategies and um, say mental processes from the previous system, but also it's inheriting new ones because it's going towards another trajectory. And, and that can be massively problematic because there's nothing clear cut uh, because it's kind of in this hybrid stage of moving from one uh, system to another. But uh, having said that, I mean, th there has also been a, a lot of transfer of knowledge and practice because the, the actual framework which the book was written uh, and researched it was uh, within this project called um, this European uh, project with, uh, funder, which was called INTAS. And this was for the this internationalization of contacts between uh, EU countries and those of the what they refer to as the former Soviet uh, Union. And so to, to get academics to work together uh, in order to uh, strengthen both sides through knowledge and practice. And so th this was done within this framework of crisis management, uh, both in Ukraine and Russia at the same time. So th there were three different countries, Sweden, Ukraine, Russia, uh, doing this project at the same time. And one thing was clear that, yeah, yes, um, you have a, a new generation of people coming, uh, both in terms of academia, as well as the political uh, circles, as, as well as the practitioner uh, circles. And th there is this kind of inheritance because those who are high up in the system of crisis management were, were also there uh, during the Soviet period. So you, you, you have this kind of delayed effect there. And you have this uh, up and coming young generation, uh, which are quite a few of these people who wrote on this, this is uh, this is what they represent, this new coming generation who have been exposed to these international ideas of best practice uh, and so forth. And yeah, so you, you can see that there is going to be a, is a change. And I mean, th this is where uh, the um, co-editors, uh, uh, Kapitaninka and Lavrinyuk, uh, both represented this new kind of the cross between practitioner and academic. And um, this is why, as a the foreigner on there, it, it was uh, sort of my job to more observe and to guide where they they put the knowledge in um, a digestible and pre uh, presentable form. Well, well, I mean, broadly speaking, the, the crises represent different classes of, of crisis, which I was talking about before. You, you had the, the creeping crisis and, and the, the the crisis which has the outbreak uh, form, where which is sudden. And so there was no particular uh, classification in terms of, OK, this crisis is like number one in terms of its scale and effect, uh, but rather different form, sorts of crisis. And this, this, this was what this was doing. So this wasn't in terms of the magnitude and the effect, but rather the type. If we look before, Ukraine was deep inside the Soviet Union, which had uh, very rigid borders. So you didn't have migration crisis uh, because migration just did not exist uh, as it did at this point when it collapsed uh, and Ukraine gained its, regained its independence. So this is forming a new kind of crisis. Uh, and one which not only affects Ukraine, but it also affects, uh, because Ukraine is a transit country, uh, but it also affects the destination country. So, I mean, this is quite a complex one, uh, because how do you do something which you've never managed before? Because before it did not exist. Yeah, the, the author, she did a very good job. I mean, she's quite um, detailed about it. And what it presents is, is a crisis on different levels. Firstly, this didn't exist before. Secondly, 
what kind of political priority priority was this crisis? And initially it wasn't one uh, because the Ukrainian government at that time did not really see it as a problem for Ukraine, but a problem which is going through Ukraine. And then, of course, this became more politicised because the EU started uh, trying to create some kind of resolution to this. So, yeah, it's going into the uh, political dimensions, but it's also going into the institutional dimensions because they, they, there, there was no um, way of how to manage these people which were coming through, which had no kind of uh, legal status for being there. How, how do you uh, look after these people? And, and I mean, going when you go through the chapter, you can see there's a lot of trial and error. And, the, and initially, there's a lot of kind of, well, it's a low priority. And in terms of uh, political uh, priority, but also in terms of funding priority. So uh, the, these all had negative repercussions on the ability to manage the crisis to begin with. Yes. Well, I mean, this is one of those recurring uh, crises of course, because there's been more than, than one gas war. And I mean, this, this is a crisis which is rooted in history uh, too. So, I mean, it's something which has been created because of the previous, the nature of the previous political body and how it, um, it created its uh, economic infrastructure, namely the gas pipelines uh, and so forth. So this is something which is inherited uh, by the collapse of the Soviet Union and one which needs to be uh, addressed. But then you've got these political uh, layers of politicization which go on top of this. So what he's trying to go into from the a Ukrainian perspective, I mean, how do you try and manage this? Because it's, the problem cannot be solved completely by Ukraine alone, because you've got other uh, external uh, partners or actors which need to be, uh, you need to interact with in order to achieve uh, an end result and not everyone has the same interests and the same expectations. So th this can exacerbate and lengthen uh, the crisis, of course. Uh, well, he gives the perspective of this kind of uh, political uh, crisis uh, and one which is involving, what would you say, th these political but also social uh, elements, not only of Ukraine, but uh, also those uh, which are manipulating Ukraine uh, from externally. and. So he's, lo he's looking at this notion of uh, revolution and this uh, transition based on uh, an overthrow of one system uh, for another. Uh, and in particular, he looks at Euromaidan, but he also uh, bases things uh, on what happened previously, uh, namely uh, the Orange Revolution. Uh, so this th this approach to this problem of politics, identity, uh, and these kinds of issues, and how these are communicated, uh, creating conflict, but also um, other points. Well, it, it helped because before the authors actually began writing their chapters, uh, there were a series of workshops uh, which were conducted in Kiev. And these were myself and other uh, Swedish academics coming in and introducing the uh, authors to this vocabulary so that it was something not completely new because we introduced within the context of a workshop, we discussed these different issues so that then the authors themselves understand, ah, okay, I have a problem and this is the con these are the conceptual tools which I can use to 
interpret and explain uh, the particular case that I'm doing. So, uh, I mean, this this was what facilitated it because, yes, sure. I mean, th this is uh, an interpretation, uh, an international, if you like, uh, interpretation of problems that are very Ukrainian uh, at the time. There were no huge surprises for me. Uh, so, uh, in, in this respect, um, we were more or less speaking the same language. Uh, so, so the communication was good and th these workshops definitely facilitated it because it wasn't a one-way communication um, because you had the these young uh, researchers who were uh, presenting their cases too. Uh, and generally speaking, with the, the younger generation are much more exposed to international ideas than those of the the middle ranking or the higher ranking positions. Yes, no, no, that, that was a particularly uh, complicated one because you have different levels of politics uh, involved there uh, because this was, um, yeah, identity politics, uh, if you like, uh, with the U Ukrainian flavour, but of course, there are different types of identity politics in Ukraine, especially at that time. <clears throat> so what she's um, talking about is this very specific moment in time uh, when Ukraine, it, it, the situation is getting reversed, where the, uh, the, the more Western uh, direction is getting changed uh, for uh, this more uh, conservative uh, direction, if we want to put it this way. Uh, but of course, th this this was reversed again because uh, if we look at the results of Euromaidan, th this undid those things which Yanukovych was undoing from previous uh, years. So it's a very th this creates a certain level of uh, instability, of course, uh, which she is talking about uh, in that chapter. He, he brings in an interesting dimension because, I mean, this is doing with the crisis of brand and reputation of the country. <laughs> so uh, this is what it's doing. How do uh, foreign countries, uh, many of which have are uh, actively engaged in Ukraine in terms of their foreign policy, uh, I mean, what impact does that have? And, and what are these particular interpretations and images which they're trying to project? And so he, he does a, a, a good job on that because it's a very complex issue because you have different foreign countries with very different interests. And if you look at that also, a number of the media, uh, media themselves are not a homogenous entity, even within the one country. Uh, so he does bring something different to the table, and that is this idea, I mean, how does the outside world see or at least interpret Ukraine while Ukraine is trying to find itself? Because you've got two different levels of the, this image and uh, reputation. This comes again into how how Ukrainian politics wants to uh, project Ukraine, uh, its reputation and its direction, if you like, uh, to the outside world. And you can certainly see Zelensky has been uh, criticised in some circles for taking uh, a rather hard line on those particular media outlets that do not play uh, the game, so to speak, the political game, and there's been some shutting down of different ones for different reasons. So, I mean, this, this is a worrying point in itself, um, but within this context, you've you got this great level of instability as well. Uh, and so these things are all mixing together and creating a very volatile situation uh, for these different actors especially if you look at media, because what role do they play? And I mean, the, the, these do play an important part in how Ukrainians uh, understand Ukraine, but also how foreigners understand Ukraine. 
I, I think, it, should we put it diplomatically, it's following global trends. <laughs> so in, the, in this regard, there's, there's nothing special because they understand that there is a politicization process and that just to simply label uh, inconvenient media outlets as being uh, pro-Russian or, or something like this, when they are clearly not, uh, that, that, that this is a, a, a very thin veneer. Uh, and it's not really, uh, what would you say, um, in line with the rhetoric uh, of the, the leading politicians uh, in terms of their uh, Western Euro-Atlantic integration uh, kind of uh, discourse. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge problem. And I mean, th this is not uncommon at the moment, because even if you go to a country of uh, previously high trust, high social trust in media like Sweden, uh, I mean, the numbers are just plummeting down uh, and they're already around 50, 55 percent, whereas previously, and this is not long ago, this was like 70, 80 uh, percent, let alone if we talk about these uh, Pew uh, polls, which have been done recently with the US and the UK, where trust in media uh, is kind of at these post-Soviet levels, uh, where it's uh, mid-40s even, uh, the, the level of trust in media. So it's, to use a rather uh, vague euphemism, it's nothing special, and, and it's uh, bred out of not only the historical past, uh, but also the, this level, the, this, uh, so the idea of social contract, social interact and interaction between the authorities uh, and uh, the, the, the population. The conclusion which you're talking about was trying to bring together uh, the combined knowledge of, of all of the previous chapters uh, in terms of, okay, th this is where it's been at. The, the, these different aspects and based on that how is it going to go and well unfortunately it hasn't been going well because of exactly the things you say and yeah I mean it's sad to see because uh, I mean I've been still traveling to Ukraine uh, since this time of the book uh, and even and well before uh, the, the time of uh, Orange, even before the Orange Revolution, yeah, just after the Orange Revolution, and you can actually see a change in terms of the national character. Uh, people are not the same as they used to be. That they're much more cynical, and I, I think with less hope. So, uh, I mean, this is. Uh, circumstances uh, have definitely not been kind. So, uh, I mean, this is the what kinds of you have a, an action and then you have an effect, and, and this this is where it's going. And if, if we look at the editors, that we had the two editors uh, who have been uh, working with since two thousand and seven, I think and one of them now lives outside Ukraine. Uh, the other one still lives in Ukraine. But I mean, th this is another point. I mean, um, yeah, it, it's hard to live in a country uh, like this and the, the different unpredictabilities that come. And when you talk, if we get beyond this academic ivory tower and talk with ordinary people on the street, then yeah, yeah I mean, you do, not get a very encouraging picture from them. So uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, very cheerful in, in terms of where this is going, but I'm just um, hoping that with time uh, that this new generation uh, can come through and climb up so that they can actually address a number of these massive problems that need addressing which are not being addressed, such as what you say, this law and order, this Gongadze. I mean, this this was a, a case which is, is kind of symptomatic uh, of the problems in, in terms of this understanding of law, order, justice, uh, and so forth, which is being selectively applied at the moment. I, th I think 
the, the problem is the Stongarza case, I mean, before 2014, it, it was still on the agenda uh, because um, th th this was quite um, a symbolic case uh, in terms of the need for uh, this, the sense of justice to be done. However, uh, what's happened since 2014 has just pushed, uh, pushed it off the, the screen because there are so many other things including the, this uh, struggle for daily existence, uh, physically. <laughs> so uh, be able to manage finances and so forth, uh, all, all these daily things. And so this, yeah, I mean, you, you just see this um, increasing cynicism, uh, w which is creeping in. Certainly, I mean, it depends where you are and who you are in terms of political uh, view and world view. Because, yes, the uh, Euromaidan shootings are important for some. Others uh, are, are focused more, for example, on uh, what happened in Odessa uh, in the trade union building. Uh, others are kind of out of politics and just trying to uh, survive day to day uh, in terms of ability to live. A reasonable life. It was our job to sort of, along with these uh, Ukrainian editors, to frame how this all fits together and to rise another level or two above the individual chapters so that the sum of the, the different individual chapters uh, can come to something meaningful in, in terms of the added value of the knowledge which comes from extracting the lessons from all of these ones. Uh, and I think it worked well. Um, and this was in part, if we look at, at the uh, introduction, a series of research questions were posed. Uh, and these were then answered in the uh, conclusion. So th this was the mechanism for bringing uh, everything together and as you say, I mean, that, there's a lot of information, individual information and very varied information in the individual chapters. And so this was an attempt to sort of compress that into something which is, uh, and condense it into something which is meaningful and comprehensible. It's illustrative uh, what has happened in Ukraine. And it's also a warning uh, about what can happen when you get this deep politicization of a crisis uh, because then when we look at a crisis there, there are two aspects what we were focusing on mostly in this interview was the physical crisis uh, that is the, the migration uh, issue or the gas wars or uh, all of the or the um, these different Euromaidan uh, each each chapter. But these ones are greatly affected by, you have this physical crisis, but around each physical crisis, you have this crisis of information. And this is something which runs parallel to, to the physical crisis. And what it does, this is what people react to, because you've got this, th these uh, informational uh, crisis is actually the thing which is more um, deeply impacting how an individual, whether they are in the middle of the crisis or they are completely detached from the crisis, but it's how they form their perception of that crisis, their opinions, and therefore uh, determines how they see uh, that the crisis should be resolved. And unfortunately, a lot of these crises are being not addressed, the symptoms are being addressed, but not the root causes. Uh, so, I mean, this is one of the biggest problems, and maybe to end there, that if anything, a lot of the root causes of these individual crises have not been resolved. And so this creates in the future, the prospect of what, what I called a creeping crisis earlier, because it will come up 
again, poss hopefully not, but possibly at some future stage. I mean, a crisis has two sides to it. Uh, most people see the threat side, uh, but for a select few, a crisis is an opportunity. Uh, it can be an economic opportunity, it can be a political opportunity, it's something, a crisis, because I said it's an extraordinary situation. So if you have an extraordinary situation, the traditional rules of the game, how you play it, go out the window, which gives uh, operational freedom uh, to achieve whatever it is that you want to achieve. And unfortunately, I mean, it's cynical, uh, but effective. I mean, the problem with the research uh, funding now, it's becoming very politicized. So if you are trying to dig into something which I mean, it's absolutely critical, but it's not popular uh, to understand, Th then the chances are this will be denied on some kind of technical grounds, whereas something which is rather useless, uh, but politically popular uh, can get uh, funded. Uh, I've noticed that that is going more and more this direction. Thanks very much uh, for the interview. Oh, I have no idea what happened to the original email. It, it disappeared, so it got buried somewhere deep and in, deep inside my email box. Okay, thanks for the interview and good luck.